Today we're in the resiliency room of the South Long Complex here at the University of Virginia. And we're joined by a colleague, Eric Braun. Eric Braun is a professor of religion at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma. He's a specialist in the Buddhist traditions of Burma. His recent book, The Birth of Insight, Meditation, Modern Buddhism, and the Burmese monk, Lady Sayada, a book published in 2013 by the University of Chicago Press. Today we're going to be talking about the role that Burma played in the rise of meditation as a mass movement around the world. Um, so Eric, thank you so much for being here with us today. Glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you how you became interested in uh, Burmese Buddhism and the scholarly study of Burmese Buddhism. Well, I had been generally interested in Buddhism from fairly early on, from early high school years. For what reason, I'm not sure. Students often ask me, and I say, well, karma. I mean, it's really hard to say, but I'd become quite interested, and in, uh, eventually, after college, I was in San Francisco and uh, began attending the San Francisco Zen Center and sort of caught the bug more specifically then, went off and traveled in Asia, and eventually that ended up uh, leading to graduate school because I had an intellectual interest really from the beginning in it as well as a personal interest and really the intellectual interest came to the fore and when I was in graduate school actually I became more interested specifically in the history of meditation and began to look around uh, already interested in the traditions of South and Southeast Asia which is where Theravada Buddhism as you know is uh, mainly located and noticed that many of the traditions of meditation had emerged out of Burma uh, and that sort of directed my attention there and well from then on I was off and running I began to really look more closely into the history uh, of the literature there and the teaching uh, of the lineages and that led to field work in Burma uh, for for a pretty extensive amount of time and uh, and essentially I've been focused on that area and this topic ever since so what year was that uh, that I went yes. or and when did you first start going to Burma? Uh, 2005. Mm -hmm. So I was there, well, 2004 to 2005, I actually straddled those two years when I was first there. And was it easy to go to Burma at that point? Or difficult to do research? Uh, it was pretty challenging, in fact. In 1996, Burma had finally opened up from being essentially a hermit state where you could visit for three days, and mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, they expanded it to seven days. For years, that was all you could go. Um, then in 96, they, they lengthened the visa to a month. But longer than a month, unless you were there specifically to live in a meditation center and meditate, mm -hmm. um, or it was quite challenging. So my wife was with me, and really it was by hook and crook that we managed to, to cobble together various justifications for being there for a much longer period of time than that. Mm -hmm. By teaching, by, um, oh gosh, by essentially, well, this is not something, we might want to cut this out, but um, I actually, you, what you had to do was get yourself a fake business visa. So in Bangkok, you could purchase a fake business visa, so we were there for quite a few months on that. I, I worked for a company called Interphonics, is uh, what they said. But, um, but anyway, uh, by, t by teaching, by my wife specifically, by her teaching, by also just, this was actually allowed, but um, just entailed a lot of hassles, but you can overstay your visa and just pay a fine, so we overstayed. But by all these means, we managed to end up being there for, oh, getting on close to a year. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long now. It wasn't a, it wasn't a full year, but it was, it was quite a while. Uh, and then ever since then, usually about every other year, I've gone back. Mm -hmm. And were you able to spend time in a meditation center during that, yeah, during I, that time? We were. Um, it, only, in fact, we only did we did one ten day retreat within the tradition. Of, you mentioned the monk Lady Seda as part of the title of my book, because my interest was specifically in him because he was such an innovative figure. Uh, I decided to do a retreat within the lineage that looks back to him as uh, as the sort of founder of their practice. And so we did do my wife as well as I did a ten day retreat at the International Meditation Center, which is the center of a teacher uh, who who has died now, but. Um, but whose center is still very much going, uh, named Uba Kin. In fact, we were there uh, doing the 10-day retreat during the tsunami and the earthquake that preceded it. Uh, I actually begin the book with that story because it was, it was really quite interesting. We were actually in meditation. Uh, 
and suddenly the whole building begins to sway back and forth. And I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake, but it usually feels like an 18-wheeler going by or a very large truck. Everything shakes. But in this one, everything began to undulate in, in the room. Uh, but the lead teacher, uh, this is the reason I included it in the book, uh, his name is Wu Tian Yi. He, he did not move a muscle during this quite long earthquake. He simply sat there in meditation, and because he did, no one else felt they could move. It really exemplified in a small way, but a very interesting way, the, the power of meditation and, its, and the authority around it. Because he didn't move, we didn't move. And so we, uh, we all sat there throughout, through the earthquake um, and just wrote it out, essentially. So that was the, the memorable, but the one, the one extensive period of meditation we did while we were there. Um, so you had undertaken a retreat uh, in the tradition that was founded by Lady Sayada, And I want to ask you how you became interested in uh, his writings and his life in particular. Did that precede the retreat or w w did that come after engaging in meditation within his tradition? Uh, it, it, well, I suppose it did actually um, follow some engagement within uh, the tradition that looks back to him. Uh, I had learned when I was when I was I had already learned of Lady when I was looking in graduate school early on at, at who the key figures were in the development of meditation in the modern era, and, and I had gone to do a Goinka retreat. Essen Goinka is another teacher who looks back to Lady as a founding figure, and there's a meditation center in his uh, his practice lineage in Western Massachusetts, and I had gone there and done a meditation retreat as well. It was also a 10-day retreat, just like the one in Burma. Um, Uba Kin, in fact, had been Essen Goinka's teacher, so they're in a, a, a direct connection to one another. And that had, through them, uh, I had come to see more, uh, more powerfully how important Lady was. They, that organization of Essen Goinka publishes a number of books in English translation of Lady's works, uh, and just generally celebrates Lady as this, uh, this critical figure in the re-emergence from their perspective of meditation. As they understand it, meditation in essentially the same style and practices is going on right now, they understand to have always been going on since the time of the Buddha. Um, and that, but they position Lady as a particularly important figure for bringing that technique of practice to wider attention. So they themselves look to him as somebody who's um, seminal in the development of meditation practice in the modern period. And that you know, drew me back to Lady, uh, particularly because I was interested in trying to get at the start of this, this modern tradition of practice. So through Essen Goinka and that engagement with practice there, I was led back to him and, and sort of more, turned my attention more directly to him because as it turned out, many people branch off from Lady, not just the Essen Goinka tradition. And now, did, did Lady himself see his reformulation of the teachings as carrying something forward that had existed in Burmese Buddhism or Buddhism writ large for a long time? Did he posit that there were there was an unbroken tradition of meditation for millennia? Right. N no, not so far as I can tell. Um, I think he certainly. This is quite. This is implicit um, in his writings that he. Well, and it's quite explicit actually that he is carrying on the teaching of the Dhamma. That he's that he's relying upon um, authoritative commentaries and traditions of teaching. But in terms of practice, it seems that uh, he saw himself as taking tra traditions of um, textual teaching of meditation and, let's say, theoretical reflection upon meditation that had existed in an unbroken lineage, let's say, back to the time of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, he, he certainly saw himself taking those traditions, but in, in that, to that degree being connected to, to some, an unbroken line. But in terms of actual practice, it seems that he, he did understand himself to be presenting something um, new. Uh, something new in the sense that it was to be actually practiced among a wide group of people. New in the sense that it would be um, very particular techniques that would be based upon authoritative tradition, but that would be um, formulated to be appropriate to the people he was speaking to. So I think he understood himself as a blend of um, innovation and tradition, uh, rooted in tradition, but definitely taking steps to respond to what was going on at the time he was alive. So is it fair to say that uh, 
his vision of the, the continuity of meditation practice within Buddhist traditions was different than the people that came after him, such as Ubakim and, and Goenka? It's not clear that Uba, Ubakim, so far as I, now there may be a place where he says, he says something specifically about this, but I have not seen a place where he makes so strong an assertion that mm -hmm. he teaches an, uh, an unchanged uh, tradition of meditation going back to the Buddha. That seems to be particular to the Esengo Inca tradition, which is now, of course, a very large and dominant tradition. That seems not to align with Lady. So to, in that sense, I think there's a very different view of the tradition between what Lady seems to have thought versus um, what the Goenka tradition says. Now, the, I should say the Goenka uh, folks, uh, Goenka himself, in, in one work he's written in English called the uh, Satipatthana Sutta Discourses, he says that Lady stated that he had learned his technique from a monk in Mandalay, but had not said who the, the particular name of that monk, who that monk was. But I have not been able to find any record of where he would have said that, uh, who that monk possibly could have been. There, uh, I have no indica indication from looking at any of Lady's works that Lady actually really meditated uh, much, if any, in Mand when, during the period when he lived in Mandalay, which was um, essentially, on a long-term basis, he, uh, he lived in Mand Mandalay from about 1867 to 1883, and then he left uh, to go back to another part of Burma uh, and only returned to Mandalay intermittently f uh, after that. Uh, and during that long period, he seems to have mostly, or if not entirely, have been a scholar. Mm -hmm. You mention in your book, a, it must have been that um, statement by Goenka mm -hmm. that Lady had practiced with essentially a yogi um, in the retreat. It was in a cave. Yeah. Um, t t t t do you know what do you know what part I'm talking about? Where you say that he's he, he certainly met meditated. someone in a cave and that's the one who gave him the meditation instructions. Oh, this is um, this is the Mingun Seada. Uh, Unarda meets posits that he met a meditation okay. master in a cave in Sagain. Okay. And learn the technique from that. Okay, person. will you tell that one a little bit more fully? Because that's an interesting origin story, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some disagreement among the texts about who, uh, about this story, um, in, but the 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 most well-known version of it is found in um, the book *The Heart of Buddhist Meditation* by Nyani Ponikatera, um, who's a critical figure to certainly to the formulation of meditation um, in the West. Uh, and as he tells it. The Mingun Seada, who was a junior to Lady by about 24 years, so probably influenced by Lady generally because he would have read his works. Lady was very, very well known, but who was sort of his own man at the same time, is said to have been very dissatisfied with the teachings he had received about meditation and began going around looking for a master. One place he went, which made a lot of sense in his time and even today is still true, that if one wants to try to find a meditation master in Burma, particularly a monastic meditation master, uh, one of the first places you would go is the Sagain Hills, an area of these fairly tall hills just on the banks of the Ayawadi River, uh, not too far from Mandalay, maybe like, you know, maybe a half an hour drive. Uh, and it's said that Mingo and Seara went to these Sagain Hills, there's many caves in these hills as well as monasteries, found in a cave um, uh, a meditation master who actually said to him, why are you looking around for somebody to teach you this? You've got the Satipatthana Sutta, the Foundations of Mindfulness Sutta. Use that. Uh, and it said that Mingon took inspiration from that recommendation, went back to that sutta and read it again, and then came up with the, um, with the particular technique that, that he actually had, um, ha has spread quite widely throughout the world. The, the story of the birth of insight meditation that you tell in your book is in large part uh, about uh, people who are intellectuals and monastics. They are uh, well versed in the classical literature of, of Buddhism. And there's another tradition in Burma of wizards or waitsa mm -hmm. who are also known to practice forms of contemplation as well. Right. Is there a relationship between those two? Well, this is, this is fairly um, unexplored territory, particularly in Western scholarship. But even in 
um, Burma, the nature of the Waitsa as these figures who, who now are often called wizards um, is, is, is one of secrecy. And so one's information about them, it, it can be rather hard to find a lot of detail about how these organizations understand themselves to be relating to other traditions. There has been classically in Burma, and the scholar Gustav Hauptmann has um, written probably, well, he's one of the, one of the um, scholars who's written the most on this. Uh, uh, there has been a tension between Vipassana insight uh, meditation traditions and these weights of traditions. They see themselves often as following rather divergent paths. Uh, and particularly the insight uh, folks, at least the, the sort of institutional authorities of Vipassana meditation, have tended to keep the weights at arm's length. There's a famous story, or famous within the lineage, of Uba Kin uh, discovering that, one, that a meditator at his center, the same center I was at uh, when the tsunami happened, discovered that somebody was using beads. And beads might seem innocuous, but they're associated in Burma typically with, with samatha practice. With, and then by virtue of that, they're associated with, to some degree, they're colored with a kind of weight um, uh, coloration, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, it said that Uba Kin, when he, when he caught him doing this, said, no, got to go, no beads here. You know, we don't do that sort of thing. Uh, this sort of exemplifies this idea of a split between insight and, and weight -sa. But there, realistically, it seems on the level of lived practice, as much as is known about it, one can move between these worlds. And they aren't necessarily seen as antithetical to each other entirely. Because, of course, classically in the Buddhist conception of meditation from the Theravada perspective, you can have both samatha and vipassana, and there's no problem with having these two in some sort of relationship to one another. So even in a person's life, you might be able to combine these. But typically, they are understood to follow distinct tracks and be, uh, to a significant degree, separate from one another. Lady Seada himself is said to have met a number of Waitsa living together in the forest. There's actually a picture of Lady encountering them at his monastery. There's a painting, not a picture, but a, but a, but a painting of him speaking to these Waitsa. Uh, and they ask him to reveal the true path of Waitsa to them. Now, Waitsa is the Burmese pronunciation of the word vidya, in Pali, knowledge, or vidya in Sanskrit. Uh, and Lady sort of takes this opportunity to play, to play off that root of the word and then give them a teaching that is not about Waitsa as um, wizard-like practices that extend your life or give you supernatural powers, but as an actual preaching on um, true Buddhist knowledge, which ends up being very orthodox knowledge about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and all the sort of um, doctrinal matters we might expect. That, too, sort of reveals an idea that from the Orthodox Buddhist perspective in Burma, uh, the, the true focus is seen, well, it's, it's believed that it ought to be on this, these sort of classical doctrinal ideas and with a real downplaying of these wizard practices. Mm -hmm. But uh, that said, weights of practice is very, it's much smaller, much smaller, I think, as a kind of dedicated path for people who are truly dedicated to it. They're, they're smaller numbers than insight, but it is still very much a flourishing aspect of Burmese Buddhism, uh, not to be denied, um, that to some degree sits in the shadows compared to the insight practices. Does classical Buddhist learning play a part in the Waitsa tradition? It does. I mean, they very much understand themselves within the, the, the orthodox understanding of, of the world uh, with, with all the teachings on, on, um, on, of doctrine, with... Um, we, even with all the understanding of what insight meditation would involve, there's no, there's no conflict there. They don't have an alternative argument for what Buddhism is. They very much fit themselves within it, but they have selected an option in which they emphasize a kind of what the Burmese would call a, um, a laukika sort of perspective, a very worldly kind of perspective in the service of another worldly end, which is to say that they are going to extend their lives and gain... Um, magical powers, what we would consider magical, I guess we could say supernatural powers, um, because they're quite rational from a Buddhist perspective. They're just beyond what you know, is typically under people's control or abilities. Um, so they, they operate within the same framework, but they've chosen a certain path that is um, looked at askance by a significant um, orthodox segment of the Buddhist population. And the end would be 
a better rebirth? Um, no, well, ideally, for, for many, no rebirth at all. They would extend their lives. Awaitsa, so there's classically two goals, as I understand it, of Awaitsa, uh, which is to extend one's life to the point where one can be around until um, the time of the future Buddha, Mateya, which, of course, would be the most effective time to gain uh, awakening because you'd have a Buddha with you who could, whose upaya, whose skillful means would be so great. You'd, you'd sort of be set on the royal road to awakening in that life. Um, at the same time, uh, wait to dedicate themselves to the protection of Buddhism through the, through the supernatural powers they gain um, and through their long lives as well. And so they are protectors and safeguarders of Buddhism at the same time they are themselves extending their lives to live to the point where they themselves can gain an easy awakening under the next Buddha. But, so, but being around at the time when Mateya comes could also be a goal of a more orthodox uh, Absolutely. Uh, meditator yes, as well. Right? That's true. But it would be def conceived in terms of rebirth and not longevity. Is that, is that right? That is right. Yes, that's definitely true. In fact, Lady himself makes a comment in one of his works where he says, well, and then when, when Mateya comes around, I'm going to be his most unsurpassed disciple. So he clearly had an idea that through rebirth, for Lady it was definitely not going to be this Waitsa path, mm -hmm. through rebirth um, he was going to reach the same spot I suppose those Waitsa would understand themselves reaching. Um, but of course they just take alternate routes. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, several, it's, a couple of it's a couple of roads I guess to the same place. It's different ways to do it. Of course you wouldn't be acting as a protector in quite the same way if you didn't take the weights of path. So I suppose that's one reason there could be an argument that that's the preferable way, or at least for, for a particular person anyway, to, to um, choose to take the weights of path. Is there a sense in which uh, the cultivation of moral integrity in a, in a more orthodox sense is protection for Buddhism, for the tradition? I'm wondering if they're as different as they say they are, right? where one Waitsa uses supernatural means to protect the tradition right. and uh, more tradition, more orthodox path uses uh, ortho, uh, blah, blah, um, and a more orthodox tradition might use the cultivation of virtues. Right. And it's absolutely true that virtue is, you know, it's not just its own reward. It, it, it protects Buddhism as well, and not only helps the person, but it helps everybody. Actually, that's a key argument for, the, for Lady Sayadaw for promoting insight meditation for the first time to a mass audience, is because certainly learning the Dhamma was going to protect Buddhism, because if the Dhamma does, disappears, of course, Buddhism is in, well, Buddhism is essentially going away as well. Um, but at the same time, virtue just acts as a kind of bulwark to support the sasana, the tradition of Buddhism. Um, so it's quite true that in many ways, the sensibility, the motivations, uh, even the sensibilities, the, the um, underlying reasons for doing these things would be there'd, there'd be, there'd be several options for protection for, um, uh, well, let's say there'd be several options for, for helping Buddhism, for keeping it safe, for protecting it. Uh, and the choice to go one way or another um, I couldn't tell you definitively what calculus would be used by a particular Burmese person. There has been some very interesting work done, some really cutting edge work um, by people like the scholar Thomas Patton, uh, ethnographic work on why people have chosen, for instance, the Waitsa path. That those, uh, Nicholas uh, Foxius uh, is another scholar who's done work with these communities where they explain the reasons for their, for their choices. But there, but there clearly are live reasons for people why they would feel compelled to choose one over the other. I, this is just, I'm hazarding a guess here, but I think that there might be a sense sometimes that the Waitsa path is, is a more immediate means to address a problem if it seems like the existential threat is really pressing. Uh, and so at a time of political destabilization, for instance, in the 1950s, um, when uh, Waitsa communities certainly were... Um, going full force, um, or during times like the rule of the military junta uh, and the various uh, destabilizations that happened during, during that long period from 62 up until uh, just very recently, um, there might be s seen a need to take a very overt response that can more, more directly manipulate the world. And that may be a motivation for the Waitsa path. So throughout the 20th century, there have been 
a variety of meditation movements in Burma. Some have favored insight meditation, others have favored samatha meditation and have been adamant that uh, the jhanas are the primary uh, focus for meditation, the primary, um, the primary technology of meditation. Now this might bear more similarity to uh, practices that the Waitso would engage in. How do the Waitso relate to other traditions of meditation in Burma that have been prominent in the 20th century? Well, I think even with, it's quite true that there's been, there, there's a strong tradition of Samatha meditation, it's, it seems anyway, because it is not n nearly as um, immediately self-evident as the inside traditions. But it's, it's quite obvious on a, on a sort of granular level when you speak to people, when you go to a, uh, a pagoda or a stupa or, a, um, um, or just a place of practice, that there are people doing Samatha meditation. Because as I was saying earlier, um, it is associated with, say, with the use of beads and such practices, which you can see going on. But some, while weights, uh, so far as I understand it, the practices that are meant to engender supernatural powers, which is, this is completely fitting with canonical warrant, I suppose, while those are very much samatha practices, it doesn't mean that all samatha uh, has a natural fit with weights. Uh, so there, there can be a real, there certainly is a divide there. Um, there can be, for sure. I mean, certainly a Waitsa practitioner could be somebody who's doing Samatha um, for other purposes, I suppose, or just generally. But it, when it comes to the development of these, these people in, within, the, within jhana practice, they aren't typically, who are, let's say, who are not specifically aligning themselves with Waitsa movements or Waitsa groups. Um, they don't necessarily need to see themselves as being um, arguing for something in opposition to the insight uh, practitioners. It, it, in a sense, they too would buy into the dominant ideology that suggests that insight is the crowning achievement of Buddhist practice, that samatha is a sort of preparatory exercise and to some degree secondary to the Buddha's original contribution of insight. Yet they could still choose that as an option because it, it may seem appropriate for their lives, for, for what the, what's going on with them, for some purpose that they have in mind, other than weights of practice, say. So they don't necessarily see themselves in conflict, and even with the, re, the recent, uh, fairly recent teachings of, the, of a monk who's become very well known, the Pa Otsayada, who does require typically um, deep concentrative practice involving the jhanas and such before he has his students move on into um, insight meditation, there has been that, that, that movement has created tension within Burmese Buddhism, um, but not tension because he's seen in some sense as um, suggesting a message that runs counter to the supremacy of insight full, full, fully, um, but simply because there's a notion that he's bringing back a, a, an emphasis on a practice that isn't strictly necessary. So in other words, there's, there's, there's several um, there's several different perspectives operating here. On, on the one hand, there's the weights uh, who have certainly a great deal of overlap with, with, um, with samatha practice generally, but, the, but not, they're not coterminous. Uh, the, then you have these folks who are simply doing samatha practice, concentration and calming practice, who aren't necessarily seeing themselves in opposition to the insight folks, but who have tension as well. Um, but generally speaking, it's been true that the the idea that insight practice is the culminating practice of, of Buddhist meditation, um, that it's the, the quintessential practice in a certain sense, that still certainly is the kind of dominant idea uh, in Burma, uh, really up to the present day, I would say. Uh, so, so there are a number of major uh, meditation traditions that have emerged in the 20th century, especially in Burma um, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Can you give us an overview of the, the major figures who developed these distinctive meditation traditions in Burma? And sure, sure. Um, well, generally speaking, these days the, the lineages have become, uh, the sort of family trees of practice have become have flourished. They've become very large trees, many ramifications and branches and whatnot. But 
essentially in Burma, all lineages, however complex they've entangled they've become, emerge from one of two people. Either the Mingon Seada uh, or the Lady Seada. Now, actually, Lady Seada was born um, in 1846 and is roughly 24 years senior to, if I remember correctly, the Mingo and Seada. So there may be influence um, in that regard. But um, essentially, these two figures um, start the lineages that end up spreading so widely, um, both within Burma and then outside of Burma, actually into a global phenomenon these days. Both teachers, in fact, both of those figures. Uh, now have a global reach, so to speak, through the grand, 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 grand uh, uh, sons and daughters that, that they began, uh, within the lineages, lineages that they began. Um, so Lady taught a number of people, um, particularly there was, a, there was a handful that one can um, readily note as both influential and with direct connection to subsequent uh, students who would end up uh, spreading the teaching far and wide and attracting many disciples themselves. So Lady taught people like the Mohian Seada, who was a figure in the, really in the 1930s, who attracted tremendous audiences. They say like sometimes 10,000 people would come to his talks, uh, who was very much and in, directly indebted to Lady for a technique that depended very much on the Abhidhamma, so this philosophy, as a way to frame how practice would work and what you would do within it. Um, he became quite influential and, and in a sense it was most influential as a person who spread uh, further the message of the direct connection between practice and doctrinal learning. Uh, Lady also taught a layman named Seateji who would end up teaching the layman, uh, well first I should say that the interesting thing about this is Lady taught a, uh, this layman and then set up the layman as a teacher in his own right, even over monks, which is a total upending of the normal uh, roles, uh, even in Burma today that are present typically in meditation teaching. Usually lay people do not teach monks, but monks certainly teach lay people. But Lady, and this reflects his innovative spirit, uh, put Seatechi um, uh, at, at the top of a, a, line a lineage of teaching in which lay people do teach monks. Uh, and, and can understand themselves as being empowered to be the head uh, of this particular branch, let's say, of a lineage of teaching. So Seo Techi ends up teaching Uba Kin, uh, who would end up being a very important figure in Burma, and accountant general of Burma after its independence, and um, occupied a number of important positions in Burmese government. Uba Kin would end up teaching Essen Goenka, who would, who would emigrate out of Burma to India and end up spreading um, the particular methods of his teacher Uba Ken, who was depending upon Seo Techi, um, spreading that technique all over the world. There's Essen Goenka now has over, our, I think, 120 meditation centers throughout the world, hundreds of thousands of students. I think it's reasonable to assume it passed through these centers. So really quite influential. Um, and Essen Goenka himself, of course, has trained many people um, who, who now teach. Uh, and in fact, many, most of, of, almost all of the major figures in Western Buddhism, in some way, shape, or form, have passed through the Essen Goenka system, <laughs> whether, whether attending a retreat or being um, deeply influenced by those who have. Uh, at the same time uh, l that Lady was teaching, uh, in establishing these particularly influential lineages, the Mingon Seara, uh, well, one student in particular stands out for the Mingon Seada, and that's the Mahasi Seada. From him really flows the charter method that now dominates the world, essentially, in terms of insight practice. Uh, if one is doing a mindfulness-based stress reduction program, uh, if one goes to the Insight Meditation Society, if one goes to Spirit Rock Meditation in California, um, and many other places throughout the world, if one goes to a hospital and does you know, a sort of practice for the, the alleviation of stress, uh, it's typically what you're going to learn is some form of what Mahasi Seada essentially formulated as a technique. So out of Mingon, following from Mahasi Seada, who, um, who even then traveled to the West and taught at the Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts and in California as well, um, through him comes this tremendously influential technique that's really spread far and wide. Uh, 
and Mahasi, of course, has many students, including Jack Kornfield and Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein, who certainly look to other people as influential teachers, but most definitely understand a powerful connection to the Mahasi Seado. Um, one might mention as well uh, uh, a figure named uh, Anigarika Munindra, who studied in Burma under Mahasi Seado as well, and then taught back in his home country of India, who also taught, who, who was one, I suppose, would say the principal teacher of Joseph Goldstein, for instance. Um, he was quite influential as well, but as another figure who was, in some sense, transmitting, transmitting this particular technique of the Mahasi Seado. Uh, these, so from these two figures of Mingon and Lady, out of them and, and through these other figures have, have flowed most of the influential practices that we know now that have been rooted in the Southeast Asian practices of Vipassana. At the same time, however, one has to add in the Thai forest tradition. So this is outside of Burma, of course, but this has been uh, not as dominant a tradition in some sense, as determinative for technique, but still a very, very influential tradition as a kind of leavening of the Burmese techniques. So Jack Cornfield, for instance, was a monk under Ajahn Chah in Thailand, and Ajahn Chah's um, one might say more open-ended uh, and, and almost impressionistic approach to meditation, uh, deeply influenced uh, Jack Cornfield, who of course was uh, uh, a, p a powerful force in setting up the Insight Meditation Society and in, in shaping American Buddhist sensibilities around practice. Um, essentially, Ajahn Chah and many of the Thai forest masters uh, they all emerge out of a lineage that begins with a monk named Ajahn Mun, who lived from, um, gosh, well, uh, later 19th century to about 1947. I have to get the exact dates. Um, Ajahn Mun taught a number of people who would end up uh, uh, shaping, shaping the kind of sensibility around practice in the Thai forest tradition, which put a much greater emphasis on jhanas and samatha practice generally. Uh, Ajahn Chah, not as much, but some of the other successors to Ajahn Mun, including Ajahn Li uh, and Ajahn Fuang uh, and a number of others, uh, brought an approach to practice that, that did put a great emphasis on the idea of developing deep states of concentration. And so they have operated in a sense as a kind of um, opening for practitioners in the West into, um, into teachings for those who are interested in the teachings uh, more directly focused on developing concentrative states. Uh, and so they've been quite influential really later on in that regard. So more recently people have, t some people within American Buddhism for instance have turned towards an interest in jhana meditation and deeper states of concentration. Uh, and they found a resource within these Thai forest masters to begin with Ajahn Mun and through many teachers lead um, to, even to Thai forest masters who are present and teaching even today, such as Tani Saru Bhikkhu uh, in Southern California, and a number of other teachers uh, in Thailand uh, and some in the West as well. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has also been a very influential figure in Thailand. He, he in a sense, stands um, somewhat alone as a, uh, as a figure, uh, certainly a, a well-established uh, uh, monk within the Thai uh, monastic tradition but not one who, who was correct, connected directly uh, to Thai forest traditions that, um, that developed out of Ajahn Mun. And so his focus on meditation, uh, his sort of modernist read of the need for meditation, uh, develops distinctly with him, but becomes quite influential through his teaching of a number of Westerners who passed through his monastery in Thailand. And so that adds uh, another distinctive um, influence that, that shows up even today in the West. So broadly speaking, the two key figures of Lady Sayadaw and Mingun Sayadaw in, in Burma, uh, then the Thai forest tradition in Thailand, with also the influence of Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, those are the sort of coordinates for where all the practices develop and, and then spread out into, a global, into what is essentially now a global reach. Are there Sri Lankan teachers from the mid-century that have... From like so, the 1950s? Some, yeah, yeah, that have been influential in what's come after on the global scale? Well, not in the same way. In the 1930s, they attempted in Sri Lanka to bring the Mahasi tradition there with apparently some success, but it seems to have uh, 
uh, essentially died out. And then they reintroduced Mahasi teachings to, um, to Sri Lanka in the 1950s. And that has become a really influential um, practice there as well. And there have been some very, very influential Sri Lankan teachers, but, um, but essentially most of the teachers there are in some way connected to Mahasi traditions and now also to Goenka. Uh, there is the very influential monk and, and meditation teacher named um, uh, Bhante Gunaratana, uh, who uh, essentially created from the text, rather like Lady did much earlier, created, recreated meditation as a specific technique for himself, as a practice from the text for himself. So in, in some sense, an autodidact when it comes to meditation. Um, though, uh, since all of his teachings are closely rooted in the text, they are, they are not seen, so far as I'm aware, as being anything but highly orthodox in their approach. But he stands as a, as a sort of lone figure who has been quite influential, but not in the mid mid century. This is much later. He, yeah, he's still teaching even now. But essentially, we ha one has to look to Burma too to understand how meditation came to take root in Sri Lanka and develop. I should say that, of course, from that time that it developed in Sri Lanka, there have been influential teachers in Sri Lanka teaching these methods who have become quite authoritative figures in their own right, but not ones who who are related to a lineage of practice that is distinctly Sri Lankan, in its origins anyway. Can you uh, introduce us to the basic differences between Lady Sayadaw's tradition and Mingan Sayadaw's tradition as we see them emerge in the mid 20th century, especially, I think? Sure. Well, generally speaking, both traditions understand um, Practice is not necessitating, though it's certainly not a problem, if one has deep, deep concentrative states at one's command. They don't require it. And so they're both innovative in the sense that they allow people access directly to insight practice um, without the requirement that they cultivate very, very deep states of concentration prior to that. Um, that had been an option, well, really in the tradition, um, in the, in the um, canonical tradition in the, in the literature from very early on, but, but it had been perceived up until late 19th, early 20th century that one needed those deep concentrative states before one turned to insight. And this is one reason why not many people were, were practicing meditation, because of course most Buddhists don't meditate, uh, and that was true in Burma, that's even true today. Um, but the turn of these traditions to a more accessible practice in which one didn't need these deep states uh, really opened up the, the possibility of practice. The difference, however, is that uh, even today, within the lineages that connect themselves to Lady, there is a bit more emphasis on the necessity of some development of calming and concentration prior to turning to insight. So typically, if one goes to a Mahasi center, which looks to Mingon, you begin insight meditation right away, uh, from the start. Uh, and there is the understanding that concentration sort of develops uh, concomitant to your development of insight, but you really begin the insight practice right away. Um, in the traditions that look to Lady, there's typically um, more of a, of a um, well, there, there typically is a requirement that one begin one's practice with at least a few days of dedication to the development of concentration and calm. It, now, it varies a little bit. Typically, in, in, in the traditions of Essen Goenka, uh, or rather, excuse me, typically within the, the, um, uh, the traditions that follow from, from Lady, uh, Uba, Ken, and Essen, Goenka, they will ask for maybe three days of, uh, of practice with Samatha uh, before one turns to Vipassana. Technically, the, the, arg the, the criterion that one is supposed to meet is the ability to keep one's mind on the object of attention for five minutes without wavering before one turns to insight. Uh, practically speaking, and from a, uh, one might say, a sociological uh, angle, it seems that there's a kind of overwhelming assumption that I think meditators, um, it, it's suggested to the meditator as well with their, when, when they're within these uh, retreats of 10 days that, that they have basically got it at three and a half days. You know, they're, 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 if someone is very, very honest and says, I just can't do it, it's been five minutes, but I've wavered a bunch, then they would say, keep with it. 
So there is a kind of threshold for samatha that they ideally want you to meet before you get to move on. But most people, the vast majority so far as I anecdotally am aware from having spoken to practitioners is that everybody gets it by three and a half days and you move on to the, um, to the insight practice. So there is a bit more of a, of a requirement for lady versus mahasi. Um, when it comes to technique, Typically within the lady tradition, there is a focus on the body and the four elements and the sensations within the body as the most immediate and direct route to insight that one should initially take before one moves on to anything else. So there's a number of different things you can observe, of course, um, but they focus on bodily sensation. For the Mahasi tradition, typically one begins with the sort of, one, one, one focuses on the rise and the fall of the abdomen often as a way to anchor oneself. But from that place of anchoring, one goes off to and, and, observe, and notes, typically labels, very simply with a word perhaps, um, wherever one uh, perceives an impingement upon the senses. So in Buddhism, there's six senses, right? And there's, there's the classic five, uh, and then there's also the mind. So if you hear a car passing by, you're focusing on the abdomen, but you hear the car pass by and you, and you just do a label because you notice that your attention has gone to that sound of the car passing by, you say, hearing, hearing. Then you drop it and return to the abdomen. So there's an immediate kind of um, uh, careful awareness of where any sort of sense impingement is taking place that is meant to teach one eventually the way all phenomenon arise and pass away um, as interactions with, with one's sense perceptions. So there's a there's perhaps one might say a more cognitive element to that practice from the, from the beginning rather than, than the focus strictly on the body that begins in the Essen Goenka and the Uba Ken and, um, and these traditions that look back to Lady. Now I can go on and on with things, but I don't want to, I don't want to belabor the these things too much. focus on the body uh, in, the, in the, the Lady tradition, does it include an emphasis on noticing the passing of time, noticing the changes in perception or awareness of the body? Well, yes, I suppose so, because you're, you're encouraged not to, um, to think discursively about what's going on in the body or say the passage of time, mm -hmm. um, which raises some of those, those kind of interesting issues. For instance, you're, you're often encouraged not to um, spend too much. So let, let me back up and, and explain that the way they often do it is one be after having gained some modicum of calm and concentration, one begins observing the body by, by observing the sensations directly on the skin. And one begins at the top of the, the head, at the crown, w with a space about the size of a half dollar, um, which nowadays, if I tell students a half dollar, they're like, I have no idea how big that is. But, um, you know, about an inch across or so, or so, an inch and a half. And then one moves to each part methodically throughout the entire body, all from the tip of the head to the top, uh, for, so, sorry, from the top of the head to the tips of the toes, as S. Goinka puts it. Um, you're not meant to be thinking as you're going along, um, gee, I've taken five minutes on the spot because I just don't seem to feel anything. But you are meant to be, have some awareness of how long it's taking because they don't want you hung up on a spot for too long. You're trying to feel something at every single spot. Uh, and it's suggested that eventually you will. And eventually it, the, that the, the feelings will become so dominant that they will no longer be centered on a small patch that you've selected, but will begin to just be evident throughout your body as the arising passing away of these vibrations. So none of this is meant to involve, um, of course, they, wouldn't, they, they don't consider it um, suggestion and they don't consider it something that one needs to think about. Uh, they understand it as a sort of direct perception that eventually as one repeats the process over and over again through the hours of the retreat over the 10 days or over the six, roughly six and a half days that are dedicated to insight, uh, the non-discursive immediate observation as they understand it of, of the parts of the body will eventually lead to what can be formulated within discursive terms as a kind of insight into impermanence. Um, and, you know, all the attendant realizations that come with, with Buddhist awakening. Your book, The Birth of Insight, is about a particular figure in the history of Buddhism in Burma, Lady Sayadaw. And he lived during the British colonial period. He was born in 1846 and 
died in 1923, and uh, over the course of his lifetime, he changed Buddhism in Burma uh, quite significantly. And I wonder if you could begin uh, telling, his, telling us the story of his life and his career uh, by giving us a sense of the context in which he started to do his work. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things I found most interesting about him and thought would be really fruitful to explore in terms of a, of a book-length project. It, he's born in 1846 in, in royal Burma in the, in the, at the very end of the dynasty of kings called the Kombao. And now, the lower portion of Burma had already been taken over by the British, but there was still a remnant that was free and a fairly sizable one. The British take over the upper half of Burma where Lady was living in... Um, 1885. So his life really straddles that divide between pre-colonial and colonial Burma. So what's interesting about that to me is that his, he's essentially formed as a young monk. He goes through all of his training, his formative education, um, uh, his mentorship under key figures at the court, at the royal court, all prior, of course, to the arrival of the British, but then brings that pre-colonial sensibility or training uh, already very well aware of the British, of course, even prior to their arrival in Upper Burma, but, but uh, essentially brings that, that free, free royal Arab uh, Burmese perspective to the colonial moment. So he brings old and new, so to speak, together, uh, and that makes him quite interesting. He had, he, he, when he, was, he was born in a small village called Saint Pien and um, was recognized quite early on as a... As a as a quite precocious youth. He um, ordained very early, um, uh, 10 years old, if I recall correctly, uh, and showed himself to be a superlative student. Uh, essentially never left the monkhood again. He, took a, he, he disrobed briefly at the age of 18 to um, help his parents with farming. His family, they were a family of farmers in a small village where rice farming dominated you know, life. Um, but then returned to the monkhood Motivated is said in his biographies essentially by the desire to learn. Um, so he was always somebody who had a great intellectual appetite. Uh, if you had great ambition and intellectual interest in royal era Burma, then the thing you had to do when you reached, um, uh, let's say, when you had fully ordained at the age of, at the earliest you could, at the age of 20, um, and you wanted to continue your education at the elite level, so to speak, you had to go to the capital, so you had to go to Mandalay, uh, which is where the royal capital was when Lady was that age. Uh, and so he went, uh, and he quickly distinguished himself in Mandalay as um, an excellent student, as a real up-and-comer. And he made his way through the ranks to eventually become w one of the head teachers of the monastery that he lived in Mandalay, which was a royally supported monastery with very close ties to the king. So Lady, while he's a young monk, uh, had a great vantage point through his relationships through the monastery in which he lived to see what the king and the court and the the elite level monks were who were uh, active at the court were doing to deal with the challenges of british rule to the south to deal with the challenges of the modern world and the learning from the west that was coming in that actually the court was actively seeking and collecting uh, lady formed a very close relationship um, not just with his abbot, who was called the Thanjan Seada, who was one of the king's close advisors. And so he had, of course, that route to see what was going on at the court and how monks were involved in it. He also, however, um, cultivated a relationship with um, a key court figure named U Pohlein. And Pohlein had as one of his responsibilities um, developing knowledge about the West and and at the same time modernizing Burma uh, to the extent they felt was necessary and the ways they felt was necessary. So Lady, through his relationship with Poe Hlein as well, had a way to see uh, from a really close perspective because they were, Lady was a close uh, mentee of, of Poe Hlein's. He really got to see how learning could be used particularly as a way to respond to challenges, uh, particularly the Abhidhamma, which Poe Hlein used uh, as a way to make sense out of Western learning. Uh, at the same time, Pohlein was very interested in meditation. And so Lady had a fi in the figure of Pohlein, Lady had uh, an example of somebody who was very aware of what was going on in the Western world, who was very aware of Western knowledge, and who even tried to use it in dialogue with his understanding of meditation. 
Uh, so all of that was there for Lady in his formative period. Um, at the same time, of course, Lady had a traditional, uh, we could say traditional kind of cosmological view. Uh, he understood the world to be one um, in which all things are impermanent, of course, including Buddhism itself. Uh, and the arrival of the British in 1885 really marks a moment where Lady, but Burmese society generally, um, Burmese Buddhist society, understands um, the British invasion to be part of the story of the decline of Buddhism, at least the potential decline of Buddhism. So what the arrival of the British really marks for Lady and for Burmese Buddhists more generally um, is a moment of terrible threat and worry. And I think we can understand much of the response um, in Burmese, much of the development in Burmese Buddhism, uh, much of the development of mass meditation, in fact, as a response to this terrible worry that Buddhism was going to disappear thanks to the colonial uh, um, takeover. Uh, so, Lady brought his formative educational period, his understanding of Buddhism as something that could make sense out of the modern world, modeled through somebody like Po Hlein, uh, and that met a terrible anxiety that came directly from the colonial encounter. Uh, and he sort of brought those forces together, traditional learning, um, formative experience in the royal period with uh, the pressures of the colonial period. And that's really what brought out mass meditation. Because when Lady saw this, what he understood to be a very dire situation in which Buddhism was very likely to disappear if something wasn't done, um, his response was to turn to what had been celebrated in his formative period, which was learning. It was to promote learning as a way to the masses, in a way that never had been before, as a way to preserve Buddhism uh, and to essentially um, protect it by spreading it out among the people. So in a sense, the democratization of the learning of Buddhism was a way to keep it safe when it seemed like um, it was very much under threat of disappearance, uh, thanks to the lack of care from these new colonial rulers. In 1858, Queen Victoria had issued a proclamation in response to the um, Sepoy Rebellion uh, in India, in which she argued that no, um, that her British subjects should in no way impinge upon the religious freedom of of, um, of any any colonial subjects under under British rule. Now, this to us sounds like a very kind of perhaps even enlightened perspective, freedom of religion. But to the Burmese, this idea that the government that the rulers were not going to in any way intervene to actively support Buddhism was seen as a, as a direct hostile um, threat, uh, as a really a baleful influence on Buddhism, because Buddhism needs, from the Burmese perspective anyway, needs support and care to survive. So essentially what Lady did was respond by trying to turn the role of support and care for Buddhism over to the lay people as a whole, rather than to where it had used to have been lodged, which was then the king as a central figure who was meant to protect and purify Buddhism. Uh, so much of his career can be understood as an attempt to transfer the responsibility that had been with the king to care for Buddhism over to the broad populace. And part of this care and concern uh, was the undertaking of meditation as yet another way to strengthen Buddhism. And at the same time, uh, if Buddhism is under threat, to allow people to profit from the, from the presence of Buddhism anyway for while it's around, uh, a chance to allow them to profit from it by helping themselves spiritually as best they could through meditative practice while they could. Uh, and so from the time of the arrival of the British, or not, not so many years after uh, the arrival of the British, so, so let me say, the British arrived in 1885, Lady at this time has gone off to a monastery. In 1883, he leaves and goes to his monastery. Uh, well, sorry, let me start over with this and back up to make this clear. The British had already been causing great destabilization in Burma, even prior to their arrival. Because of that, when King Mindon dies and the last and final king, his son Theba, takes over, um, at that time, the country became very, very unstable. Uh, it, and fires, part, part of that instability was um, great uh, social instability. Uh, dacoits or brigands roaming the countryside, great corruption. Um, part of this was um, uh, fires breaking out in the capital, including one that, that decimated the monastery where Lady lived in 1883. At that time, he went off to his... Um, back to his home area, to his, na to his native village. Uh, 
and went, entered the forest in a common trope that we often see in, in all forms of Buddhism, right? The, the turn to the forest. It's at this time that it seems that Lady began to, to actively meditate. When the British take over just a couple of years later, uh, and this threat um, amplifies, uh, the sense of threat to Buddhism amplifies, um, it's after a sort of period of, of his establishing his own monastery, uh, and, and then, and then a, in 1897, a trip to India, in which he says very little about this, but it seems that Lady, I can't imagine that Lady wasn't impressed by his sense of the scope and power of the British Raj at this time. Because it's when he comes, it's, it's essentially when he comes back, round about the turn of the century, 1900 or a few years after that, that he, Lady embarks upon a career of spreading Buddhism to the masses, as uh, to, of encouraging Buddhist learning among the masses, and then subsequently to that, encouraging meditation. And essentially from that period of the early years of the 20th century until his death, uh, Lady never stopped. He just continually wrote, preached, and traveled, setting up lay people into study groups, um, encouraging them to meditate, uh, and essentially engaging in a campaign for a reformulation of Buddhism in which lay people had this newly empowered role. Uh, and he continued to do that until the time that he died. The classical Buddhist literature was essential to his effort to bring Buddhism to the masses. What kinds of classical texts was he working with, and how did he, how did he reframe those in such a way that lay people could make use of them and make sense of them? Well, he was quite essentially the the, um, the via, There was three vehicles, let's say, for how he would reformulate Buddhism in a way that that regular lay people um, could make sense out of that were plausible for them to um, to use or. Um, to, uh, to study, uh, preaching, and he was known to preach in a very simple style that was also highly entertaining. Um, so classically, preaching events um, were Dharma desanas, or these teachings of the of Dhamma desanas, these teachings of the Dhamma um, were heavily loaded with Pali, were often um, more performative than, um, than concerned with content. Uh, and were very difficult for lay people typically to understand. Lady was understood to be quite innovative in um, preaching in a style that was easily understandable, that, that eschewed essentially all Pali. Um, in one of his texts he says, don't worry if it doesn't have Pali. The main point is whether you understand and you get awakening. So he was somebody who was really innovative in that regard. He was part of a movement, in fact, that was called the Fan Down, because typically in Burma, at this time, monks would preach with a fan in front of their face as a way to limit the rapport with the audience because the understanding was the point was not to get caught up in an engagement with the people who were listening to you, but to be focused just on the Dhamma, to have this fan in front of your face, you're sort of chanting, often in a monotone. Lady was part of a movement called Fan Down because they literally put the fans down and talked to the people. Uh, and that was understood to be very innovative and quite exciting. So huge crowds would come to these to these preaching events. Not just Lady, but some of his disciples, and there were other folks as well who engaged in this practice. At the same time as Lady moved around, and he, he practically never stopped. He was moving around constantly. Everywhere he went and he preached, he would organize people into groups, lay people into groups, in a, say in a given village, to study whatever topic together amongst themselves that he had preached upon. Um, but that brings in the third vehicle because besides their memory of what he preached, how would they, how would they keep their conversation going? Along with the preaching and the social organizing, Lady uh, began um, a career essentially of uh, simple, down-to-earth, easily understood writings. Typically these were deepenies, manuals or handbooks on whatever topic he felt was appropriate for, the, for people to know at that, at that time. So he wrote deepenies or these manuals on a wide variety of topics, but centered particularly on the teaching of the Abhidhamma. So this, this typically understood to be very complex um, uh, uh, and difficult uh, philosophical uh, teaching that gives reality in only its ultimate terms. Um, so it's a, it can be a very, very abstruse uh, and hard to understand system, but he framed it uh, uh, in, in an easy to understand, from the Burmese perspective as they understood it, it was a very easy to understand manner that could allow everybody to grasp it at least at a basic level. 
Uh, and he became quite well known for this. So it's actually said that he gave the Abhidhamma like falling rain. This is what one Burmese uh, writer, how, how he described it. He was constantly talking about the Abhidhamma, making it easy to understand, writing books that presented it in a way that could be read by people in, in simple Burmese. There was one book in particular that was critical in this regard. Um, I don't want to carry us too far afield in the kind of literary history of Burmese Buddhism, but there's one handbook on the Abhidhamma that not just in Burma, but across the Theravada world has been instrumental to people's understanding of this philosophical system. That's a text called the Abhidhamata Sangaha, 10th to 12th century, written in Sri Lanka. Uh, a very short text, but it gives a, with great precision a, a, mas a masterful overview of the Abhidhamma system. But it's in Pali. Uh, and so inaccessible to most Burmese in ladies' time and even today. Um, so Lady translated it, or at least he purported to translate it into simple Burmese verse. But in fact, he, he even went further than to translate it uh, and actually turned it into a, to a poem that is essentially a series of mnemonic devices for memorizing the, the fundamental aspects of the Abhidhamma system. And at the same time, uh, frames it in such a way that it's relevant to lay people's lives. So this text in particular, uh, that is the translation of the Abhidhamma Sangaha, becomes one of his most important for spreading the Abhidhamma in particular. Um, his particular translation comes to be called the Paramata Thanket in Burmese. Um, this, the summary of the ultimates is essentially what it translates as. Uh, at the same time, he also, besides the Abhidhamma canonical texts, he relied upon a number of others. He drew upon many, many different texts. He was, he was very knowledgeable about the canon as a whole. Um, but when it came to meditation, for instance, he certainly wrote about the Anapanasati Sutta uh, and a number of other, um, and made reference to a wide variety of suttas in his writing. So he, he certainly educated and instructed people on, on the message that one would find in the basic suttas, or the Sutta Pitaka of the canon, but uh, as well as making reference very often to the, to the Abhidhamma. Now, the Vinaya, as a particularly devoted to monastic life, is something that doesn't receive as much attention in all of his works that are so clearly framed for lay people, although they were popular as well among monastics. Though he does discuss in some certain works the Vinaya as well, because he wrote sometimes specifically for the monastics as well. Here you have a guy who's translating, in, in a broad sense of the word, right. classical Buddhist literature for a, a lay public. Right. Uh, this is something new. What kind of resistance did he meet in, as he went about this? You know, he did, he did attract um, some controversy for his arguments among, among monks. Um, he had attracted a great deal of controversy for one of his earliest books that had, that had critiqued, um, actually ironically, that had critiqued the Abhidhamata Sangaha, the very book he translated into Burmese and, be, and be, that became so well known. Um, but he did, not, he did not actually attract uh, controversy, um, a full-fledged movement of, of, of resistance to his, to his practices when it came to his popularization of Buddhism. It seems that um, because he was understood to be essentially transmitting the, the teachings in, um, uh, faithful to the original teachings, even if he was simplifying them for lay people, um, he didn't, he didn't uh, engender much resistance specifically for that effort. At the same time, partly the reason why he didn't was because although he was seeking to empower lay people in a sense, to um, take over the role of the king uh, and so protect Buddhism. Um, he didn't try to usurp the place of the, of the monastic. Uh, essentially, although, as I put it in the book, although he um, tends to narrow the divide between the monastic and the layperson, uh, it, it becomes much narrower, but it remains very, very deep. So he, he never um, suggests that lay people in some sense be can become uh, he never monasticizes lay people, essentially. He never suggests that lay people can become essentially the replacement for the monastic life. Uh, he, he maintains the same division even as he empowers lay people to do more than they had done previously. And so I think that that sort of threading of the needle where he maintains the system in terms of the division between monastic and or ordained and lay uh, the same even as he empowers lay people 
allowed him to avoid too much controversy. There was some, and there was some resistance, but, but there was no full-throated significant movement against him um, because of these efforts. And I think that's why, because he, although he simplified, he popularized, he was in many ways a very, very orthodox teacher. So at the same time he was popularizing the study of classical Buddhist literature, he was also popularizing forms of meditation. So take us from his work on uh, Buddhist doctrine to his work on Buddhist practice among sure. Burmese laity. Well, it seems that um, there's, there's, well, there is a quite a close connection between the two, in fact. And um, I would say that there's a, Lady creates a kind of natural segue from study to practice. Now, they're not the same, of course, but um, there's a sense in his works that he makes quite uh, explicit that study sets oneself up for success in meditative practice. Uh, and so study acts as a kind of prolegomenon to actual practice. This is, of course, true in all forms of Buddhism, that, or at least in many, in many aspects of many traditions, there's an understanding that study is necessary to proper practice. Um, not in all, but in many. Um, the, the, the distinctive thing about Lady was there was a sense in which um, establishing these social groups as he moved, say, from town to town, uh, through preaching and through writing, to study, uh, set up the, the predilection for practice in, in a group setting as well. Uh, and his argument that study itself was provided what he called the Dhamma tools, the necessary Dhamma tools for awakening, as he put it, and I think for the first time, in the Theravada tradition, at least in the modern era, in this very life, that's how he put it, in this very life one can become awakened. Uh, he, he, he makes that a possibility on, explicitly on the basis of study. So he really established a very clear organic connection between the two. Now, I, I think when you look at his works, what you can see happening is that slightly later than his promotion of study begins his promotion of practice. Uh, in, in some of the works that he was writing. And I think he understood, he came to see quite clearly that, that his ability to, to uh, uh, organize a large group of lay people, to, to get people interested so intensely in study, uh, provided him with the opportunity to push them further towards practice as well. And so he begins to talk about the, um, the value of practice uh, and even the necessity of practice for those who want to make any progress uh, even in a future life. And so he begins to, to uh, emphasize in his texts um, the value of practice along with study, uh, with that practice being empowered by that very study. Uh, and you can see this in, in many of his works. So he encourages people to take that next step, to, as he put it, to take up the burden of practice. So in the book, I, I, I mention one place uh, in his works where he says, you know, a lot of people say practice is too difficult right now. They're not sure. It may take them, uh, it'll, it may take them 100,000 years to, to get awakened. And why do they want to bother? Uh, why don't, they say, oh, I'll just wait till a life where I can get awakened in that life. And he says they don't seem to realize that um, if they don't practice now, uh, it may be millions of years, who knows how long, um, before they get the chance again to get awakened in their current life. So better to work hard now and take up the burden than have to suffer all that time before you can do it immediately. So this is the kind of argument to, as the Burmese put it, to spin cotton while the moon is bright, is their expression for make hay while the sun shines. So there's a terrible feeling of anxiety. There's a desire to protect Buddhism. Uh, learning the Dhamma can, is a means to protect that Buddhism. But now building off that practice too, is yet another means to protect Buddhism at the same time that it's um, understood as a valuable way that people now can help themselves spiritually. And so it flows from that. And you see in Lady's work, specifically ones uh, written on meditation, a desire to promote practice as something that's plausible in one's everyday lay life uh, as a way both to strengthen Buddhism but help oneself. Are there uh, short-term goals, local goals, in addition to the long-term goals that you've mentioned, the potential for a better rebirth, uh, spiritual advancement over the long haul throughout a series of lifetimes, right. what's in it for the layperson in this lifetime, uh, this side of awakening, this side of enlightenment? Right, right. Yeah? Um, well, for a lady who, who does have an orthodox perspective in many ways, um, the, 
really the benefits are long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. They're soteriological benefits. They're benefits on the other side. They're for awakening, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever the level might be. There, I suppose the most short-term, which is not particularly short-term, is the benefit of a better rebirth. So at least when one is engaged in this practice, one can see, the, one can rest assured of at least the, um, the promise that the next birth will be a good one because of this activity that's being undertaken now. But in terms of um, what we often see in modern secular meditation movements nowadays in the West, where there's an argument for um, uh, greater productivity or uh, a, hath, a healthier, happier life in the here and now, even a physically healthier life, uh, as well as maybe a psychologically healthier life, a kind of self-flourishing, that's not present uh, in the same way uh, for Lady. You know, Lady is somebody who says, um, you know, I, this is a paraphrase, but it, it's something along the lines in his book called the Vipassana Deepani, how sickening, horrible, and detestable is the life of a regular person, you know, a puta jana, um, a putu jana. Uh, you know, this is, this is the idea that life truly is dukkha. And, and so what we're aiming for and what our practice is for is uh, our eventual awakening, not something that would merely make um, this veil of tears, so to speak, a little bit better while we're here, but something that aims towards a larger goal, generally speaking. So, so was, it, was it he or someone else who said, uh, if you practice and study as a layperson, you, you can be a monk in the world, you can be like a monk in the world? He did say that. that, that was, so what does he mean by that? Does he mean that you, you're, you're reframing your, your activities in relation to a different vision of your own life? in the here and now, or does that mean you're reframe, reframing the long-term goals to meet those of a monk? Uh, you're reframing, essentially you're free, reframing your life in terms of long-term goals that meet uh, the, the sort of way of living of a monk, I yes. Um, it it so is a way that... A lay person can take up the career of a monk without becoming a monk. That's right. In essence, I mean, one wants to be careful because he, oh, sure. he's not breaking down the divide um, between monk and layperson, but he is suggesting that the potential for the layperson's life now is one that has spiritual possibilities, long term mostly, mm -hmm. that are well beyond what had been conceived before. And to that degree, they're a monk or I suppose a nun, because he certainly encouraged women as well as men to engage in, lay, lay women as well as lay men to engage in these practices. So from the time that he started to promote different forms of study and practice among the laity, this is in the 18, uh, 1890s, around the turn of the century? This is really, he's really beginning in, around, in the early 1900s. Okay, so from, from that point to the end of his life, um, how many people are we talking about? Hundreds of people? Thousands of people? Does this become a mass movement in his lifetime? It does not become a mass movement in his lifetime in the sense of uh, a mass movement of, of explicit meditative practice. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be fair to say that he, that thousands of people in some sense were connected to him through his preaching and his social organizing and his, and his manuals, which of course were spread far and wide. They're some of the first, so to speak, bestsellers in, in the print era of Burma. Um, but actual explicit meditative practice, particularly what we often imagine nowadays where we imagine a room full, filled with neatly arranged cushions with many lay people often mm -hmm. sitting on them, is not something that Lady saw really in his life. There was the initial development of classes, for instance, on meditation, or let's not say classes, but let's gatherings for meditation among lay people as a whole um, during the period of Lady's life, particularly the Mingo and Seara, um, seems to have um, Overseen or been connected to the to the first gathering of lay people explicitly to meditate in these in this large group setting, um, Lady, I argue, set the stage for this by empowering people through through learning and through these social groups and the preaching and whatnot, um, and then arguing in an influential way for the possibilities of practice. They influenced many people directly and did I think start many lay people meditating. That's actually unquestionable because in many of the texts he'll mention. Um, the people coming to him and asking more about meditation since they've begun to practice and whatnot. Um, but, uh, and of course he taught people directly who then ended up becoming mm -hmm. figures of mass, uh, leading figures within the mass meditation movement. But he's really at the, at the uh, crest of the wave, so to speak, mm -hmm. in terms of what he's doing. Uh, and then it all kind of flows after him from the efforts that he made. 
I think from the situation he set up that made it possible. Let's go back a little bit to his, um, the, the origins of his reformulation of Buddhism in the colonial period in the end of the 19th century. Sure. Um, and you said that the, the, the royal court before it fell was deeply involved with learning about uh, the British Raj, deeply involved with learning about um, European forms of knowledge. Right. And was that a part of, uh, of what he did too? Was he engaged with science, for instance, or other forms of knowledge? Uh, he, well, he was. Um, I, it's, it's not clear how extensively he would, his efforts were to learn about Western knowledge. I mean, through the figure I, um, that I mentioned earlier that Lady uh, worked with the, his mentor, Upo Line, who had um, um, uh, a French book on uh, electricity translated into Burmese, he had an ana Italian anatomy textbook translated into Burmese. Um, uh, Lady clearly, had access to this kind of basic scientific knowledge, at least to some degree. Um, he himself makes reference to the microscope, uh, to um, uh, Leibniz. Um, Leibniz, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and some other figures, and, and, and some thinking about uh, science. He even discusses science a little bit and explains that those. This is the interesting th thing about Lady and science. He clearly. Um, positions Buddhism as a kind of overarching framework that within which science can happily um, exist. So for him, and he says this explicitly in one line where he says, you know, those who just rely on microscopes and their scientific knowledge don't get things right. But even those who don't have scientific knowledge get things right when they have their Buddhism right. Uh, I'm paraphrasing him. Um, so there was there was clearly a sense that he felt that he needed to position Buddhism in relationship to scientific arguments. But there's little, you find little angst in Lady's writings about how he's going to make Buddhism, uh, how he's going to reconcile Buddhism with science, how he's going to relate the two. For him, it's, it seems to be a, um, sort of a, accepted that, that Buddhism trumps science and in some sense subsumes it within it. Uh, and he operates from that perspective clearly. Um, you know, there's a place where he argues that um, one ought to uh, bring out, there's a particular text you can bring out for, uh, for the expulsion of plague from villages. Uh, you can, well, you can use Paritta texts, or you can use, um, he says you can use Kamavacha texts, these various texts that are used for different purposes, but generally for good merit, for good karma, for protection, for Kamavacha texts are used for ordination. But he makes a comment that if these texts were often hand produced and, um, and, and very ornate and elaborate. And he makes a comment that one ought to take out the ones that are most beautifully decorated because they'll most scare the spirits that are causing these cholera and these various epidemics to break out. At the same time, he tells people they ought to get their um, inoculations. Uh, so in a way, he could happily conjoin these two and didn't really see them necessarily as in, in any conflict. Now, was meditation in particular uh, a part of his engagement with science at all? Um, not, in this, not in the way we see now, where there's an argument that, that meditation might have a scientific basis, that it, um, that it, that, you know, it, it, um, that it might produce certain effects. Um, for Lady, I think meditation particularly, he was so confident of its place within the Buddhist system, and he was so confident of the Buddhist system's superiority to and encompassing of scientific knowledge, that meditation is typically not framed uh, in a scientific way. Occasionally he'll make some reference to technology, say, or um, not so much to scientific discoveries per se, but say to technology as a way to illuminate what's going on in meditation. So he makes mention, for instance, of, the, of, the, um, of movies and the frames of a movie as a way to understand the breakdown of movements, as a way to teach impermanence. But this is a passing reference he makes, an interesting one, but a passing reference he makes. He clearly doesn't feel the need to frame meditation specifically in scientific terms as a way to justify it or as a way to explain the benefits you would get from it. That's a really fascinating passage in your book, and you, 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 you quote a, a section from one of his writings right. where he uh, 
he analyzes the, the, the frames of a movie in terms of impermanence. And right. To me, that suggests that um, Buddhist philosophy for him can have a, a direct role in our relationship with new forms of technology, can help us understand them. It's That's not true. so much that the, that the technology is going to help us understand Buddhist doctrine or practice, it's the, quite the other way around for him. Yeah, I mean, he, he had a sense that Buddhism was somehow, though know, he would have never put it this way, the kind of the ultra science or the encompassing uh, paradigm in which, which science was only sketchily fumbling towards. But he makes a comment in another part, of, that I mentioned in another part of the book, where he says, you know, if we can just get uh, a really cheap Dhamma book, something that only costs like, you know, essentially w would amount to a couple bucks these days. If we can only get those kinds of books into the hands of scientists, we got them. Because they're, as people who are trained to observe the world and observe reality generally, and who are taught to think rationally, they are going to be the most susceptible to Buddhist arguments. Because he did see uh, science is simply a way that one might illuminate Buddhism, but Buddhism certainly as being the kind of dominant discourse that, um, within, some, within which you know, a scientific example can make sense. And did that, when did that happen? Did that happen in the 20s, or was that in later decades? And so I understand is I, had, I think Uba Kin probably is the one who really systematized it. Um, so that would have been in the, um, that really would have been in the, um, kind of the 30s and 40s, but, um, uh, but it's hard to say, because we don't actually have a lot of information on um, specifically what Tetji required of people. And he may have been actually a bit more systematized than, than you know, people are quite are certain about um, or could know for sure. But um, suffice to say, it's certainly the case by the time we get to Ubakin that it has been set and systematized. And Goinka essentially takes that uh, and carries it forward. Uh, you know, maybe even makes it a little bit more, well, it does make it even more rote and rigid. And Uvakin uh, creates this systematic program in what period? In the 40s? Um, yes, the 40s. And the, the reason I'm hesitating is he doesn't f found his Insight Meditation Center until the 1950s, but he had already grown interested in meditation and was already... Um, well, I was already fully meditating and then teaching by like the the um, the 30s and 40s. So when he exactly systematized it within that time frame, which is a big one, I know I'm not exactly sure. World War II, of course, creates this gigantic interruption, and so that's why that's partly why the time period is so long. Uh, Lady had created new forms of. Uh, Buddhist doctrinal literature for lay people, and he reoriented meditation practice for lay people. Can you give us a, a, a basic introduction to the kind of meditation practices he would have introduced lay people to? Well, he put a tremendous emphasis on observation of the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. Um, uh, and he typically encourages in his writing for people to begin uh, and presumably in his teaching as well, for, um, to begin with those, because they're the most readily accessible. And so the way to observe those, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about the time period, uh, in w or when we're talking about Lady, there's, there's a great deal of flexibility he offers in how people approach the practice, in terms of how they structure their time meditating, in terms of what they do within that time. Um, so Lady would encourage people um, to meditate a great deal every day if they could, a couple hours, three hours, you know, so pretty long periods of time, at least as we, in the way we estimate it these days. Um, but at the same time, he encouraged people, and he said explicitly, the more you've developed your wisdom, the more you can, you can see um, realizations develop even in your everyday life while you're just living your normal life. So there was a way in which he understood there to be times of specific practice, but also a potential within one's everyday life if one had shaped one's vision properly through study and practice so that when you're engaging in everyday life, these truths could arise. Um, but in terms of specific technique, uh, within those times of dedicated practice, uh, he generally encouraged samatha, uh, 
calming and concentration practice, uh, at least initially, using typically the breath. So he actually wrote an entire work on the Anapanasati Sutta, uh, in which he encouraged use of the breath as a way to develop deeper concentration. Um, flowing from that, when one turns from samatha to vipassana, to insight practice, then he encouraged use of the four elements, observation of the four elements, as the most readily apparent. Now, there's a canonical reason for this, because there was, a, um, there was an understanding, or still is, that for those who have not developed deep levels of concentration, one begins with rupa, with physical matter, uh, and then proceeds to, ob to observe the mind and mental contents, nama. Um, because th that's the only way one can really do it sensibly, because one doesn't have the stillness of mind to observe um, the mind directly. Um, so one begins with the physical elements, within, particularly within the body, and then one turns to the mind. Now, in terms of observing these physical elements, um, Lady is not as specific as some of the later teachers will be about how you actually engage in the process. Not in any of the writings of his, um, that, that I have looked at, which is really almost all of them that deal with, um, that deal with meditation explicitly. Uh, he does encourage observation of the body uh, by, by noting um, what goes on in the body, the, the, the constant change that goes on in the body, um, through the arising and the passing away of these four elements constantly. So particularly in the Abhidhamma system, uh, there's an understanding that the four elements combine, and Lady makes explicit reference to this, into these subatomic particles called kalapas. The kalapa as a, as a kind of conceptual entity only actually develops in the commentarial literature, not in, uh, in the canonical Abhidhamma literature. But Letty relies upon that and suggests that each of, well, uh, teaches that each of these kalapas, uh, because they arise and they pass away constantly, um, can, will reveal themselves in the constant change in sensation and in experience in the physical body. So one observes the body notes the continual change and is taught the lesson of impermanence. Uh, and then from impermanence, of course, one understands that if all things are impermanent, uh, all things are, are inessential and not self. And therefore, if all things are constantly subject to change, they are suffering as well. So the three classic marks of existence are revealed through this observation of the body. And then once one has a grasp of this constant change within the body, one can observe the mind. But as I read it in Lady's text, there is not any pre-established um, and, and absolutely set way to go about this practice. He, in fact, in one text, actively recommends that the reader go find a, good, a qualified meditation teacher. Uh, and so he, did, he clearly didn't have a sense that his one, he had one particular method people needed to do. This was the one that they needed to do uh, and no other. He encourages them on the basis of their understanding of these basics of the practice to go and find a qualified meditation teacher. Now, he could have been that qualified meditation teacher because he did teach people directly, um, but he, he certainly didn't understand himself as the only one or that one necessarily had to study uh, technique only under his disciples. He, he's, uh, I guess we could say, a bit more Catholic in that regard in within the Buddhist world, small c Catholic. Um, his subsequent students, however, um, refine the technique and standardize it until it becomes, we see this clearly in Ubakin and most definitely in Ubakin's student S. in Goenka, um, a, very, a very clearly prescribed technique that is um, quite detailed and relatively inflexible in terms of how you're going to proceed through it. So at that point, we, um, we, we can see that um, the system has become um, really clearly established as a particular, a particular technique. Uh, and that's the one that involves observing the body bit by bit until we understand the dissolution uh, through the observation of these arising and passing away of these kalapas. Uh, so this dissolution of what's called bhanga, um, the kind of breakdown of the entire body into ephemeral um, uh, moments of matter that arise and pass away uh, and thereby teach the lesson of impermanence. So, but Lady, did, he did not elaborate on that particular practice. Is that right? well? He you know, he does discuss yeah. all of these of these possibilities of practice of the observation of physical matter of the breakdown into these uh, ephemeral moments, these ephemeral material moments that that arise and pass away. Um, but he does not lay out uh, 
a prescribed technique uh, of one particular uh, kind that is the sort of uh, becomes the standard and and um, and um, let's say dominant uh, technique that all must follow in the kind of standardized way that his students do. Mm -hmm. and, and so what does that technique look like in more detail at the time of Ubakin and Goenka? Well, there you do your three and a half days of samatha, which would involve the breath. You would you observe the breath at the nostrils, uh, just coming in and going out. Uh, you, they are actually quite clear, unlike the Mahasi tradition, they want no labeling, they want no discursive thought whatsoever. Uh, uh, from their perspective, to simply watch the breath come in and out will be non-discursive and the most effective means to settling the mind. On the basis of that three and a half days of doing that, which should lead to at least five minutes of unwavering mind on the object, they then turn uh, to the observation of the body, particularly literally on the body. So actually what they will do is they will have um, folks focus on a sort of rectangle, uh, excuse me, a triangular area around the nose and the upper lip. And what you're encouraged to do is to sense what you, or to observe, let's say, what you feel at, in that area. And often because of the breath being there particularly, it's a sensitive area, you can feel, well, they, they say many different things to many different people. I, I don't mean they, they say different things to different people, literally, that what they say is that you might feel many different things because people are so different from one another, but you might feel heat, you might feel cold, you might feel tingling, you might feel prickling. Um, all sorts of things, uh, but you'll feel something and you'll begin to get a sense of the possibilities of what sensation feels like when you begin to observe it on the skin in a way that most people haven't before. Once you've become sensitized through that practice, you begin at the top of the head and you see if you can't feel that prickling or tingling or um, hot or heat or cold or pressure or whatever you might feel in this particular spot. Uh, and then you begin to extend that to different parts of the body. When you begin the practice, for instance, in the Essen Goenka tradition, which has a highly, highly standardized method for teaching this, anywhere you go in the world, you're going to hear a recording of Essen Goenka's voice walking you through this technique. Uh, and there, um, Goenka leads you at first through, very closely through the whole process, and then, of course, sets you off on your own to do the same thing. That, and so you will go through every single part of the body and no part of the body is left out. If you begin to feel sensations deeper within your body, like say you begin to feel sensations that go inside your arm or inside your chest, at the start they might recommend you actually back it up a little bit. It's not that they want you to like stymie those feelings because that's good, that's suggesting progress, but they want you first to get an overall sense of the whole body as best you can because typically everybody will have their trouble spots. Like maybe you can't feel much in the small of your back or maybe you can't feel much on your earlobe, or I don't, I don't know, wherever it might be. Um, but eventually, you'll feel it everywhere, like you're, a, you're just a, somehow without any container, you're just a gigantic um, mass of, of um, Sprite. You know, you're just, you're like carbonation, you're, you're soda water, let's say, you're just bubbling. That's all you are, is these kind of ephemeral bubbles passing away and, and arising. That's what the Kalapas will feel like. Uh, it, this, is under, this is Bunga, this is dissolution, and it's understood to be profoundly, well, it's a, it's a profound marker of a, of, a, of a significant milestone of progress. Uh, it's at the same time profoundly enrapturing and pleasurable. And one dangerous, for instance, the Goenka tradition will recognize is that people will then chase after that feeling, uh, which ironically will make it recede further away from them often, because um, if you want it, you can't have it kind of thing. But you'll eventually get to the point where you have this dissolution and now you should still observe the sensations, but now you can operate in a more whole body perspective. You can sweep, as they call it. So you just kind of travel down the body and, th and up, uh, or you might sense the whole body as one, as, as this kind of, you know, this kind of um, effervescent entity. Uh, at the same time, towards the end of these retreats, they might suggest that you can you can f you can move these, you can sense this throughout your entire body within as well. Is there a systematic way to move from the exterior to the interior? Well, when you've reached dissolution, you've essentially moved into the interior as well. And, uh, and as I understand it, now I should say that um, everything I'm telling you now is something that, and I suppose telling everyone who's watching, this is not something they will tell you in literature. This is not something you really should hear until, theoretically, until you're, um, you're engaged in the actual instruction in the practice. Now this raises an issue of what we as outsiders talk about. But I think to, to understand what's going on in historical change, 
you have to, to some degree, understand these these techniques as they're as they're explained to the practitioner. Um, my, but but I hasten to say this because um, this is not something you're going to find and be able to refer to in a text. So I, this is off my memory, and I am no master of the Goenka technique. I, I make no claims to have any um, great knowledge of, of what these experiences are like personally. Um, or how would one would engage with them once one's talking to the teacher because one has accomplished these milestones. But it is my impression from having attended some of these retreats that um, there's rather an organic sense that, that you will naturally move to a whole body experience and not just a surface level, a literal surface level. Uh, and that there isn't a rote moment where they say, okay, time to move inside. Uh, um, but rather they allow your awareness to deepen that as you your awareness deepens on on the surface level it begins to move inside as well so that when you achieve dissolution it's going to be of the whole body it's not that you're like soda water just on the outside but there's a rock on the inside you're you're you entirely break apart this is why it's understood to be so transformative and moving for people uh and so um as i understand it it's there's a kind of natural organic just as there's a kind of natural organic i guess dissolution to the body there's a kind of approach to the awareness of that dissolution throughout the whole body that kind of develops um, um, just as a matter of course as you continue the practice as you're moving throughout your whole body. When Lady sowed the seeds for uh, mass practice, right, which later became something that any number of people from, from for any walk of life could could undertake if they um, had the desire to do so and the time to engage in right. sufficient retreat. Um, really, he opened the doors for uh, people to engage in what are often very esoteric and, and uh, uh, practices that are accorded great power by the tradition. Right. Is there a sense that he gave too much away, that he relinquished too much control when he uh, said this should be a lay movement? I don't get the sense um, that, that there is that feeling um, in the sense um, that it's understood to only confirm what ought to be the experience of any um, accomplished practitioner uh, who engages with the texts. So um, I don't know if ethnographically, if you, if you immerse yourself in, in, say, the Goenka tradition in a way I haven't, that you begin to get a sense of, um, of consequences that relate to power for claims to accomplishment. But generally speaking, people, as is true in many different meditation traditions, are very reticent to talk about their accomplishments, at least outside of the close teacher-disciple relationship or, or when you're very much in school, so to speak. Um, so, you know, there, there may be a sense there of power. Well, the, no one within the tradition would regret this fact, though, that, that, that they had this at their disposal. In terms of the larger monastic community or, or Orthodox Buddhism in Burma, um, I've not had the sense that there's a feeling that um, really that, uh, that too much has been given away. I think partly because besides the very much flourishing Goenka tradition, though mostly flourishing outside of Burma, that there very much are Goenka meditation centers within Burma as well as Uba Kin's original center. But besides that tradition, these meditation traditions tend to be um, headed by monks and to that degree, and, and really dominated by um, monastic teachers. Uh, and so to that degree, under the control of um, the monastic Orthodox um, establishment, let's say. Uh, and perhaps that undercuts any sense that there might be a danger that um, these these practices are are um, uh, have in some sense given away too much. Mm -hmm. Is there some particular sense you have of like a way that there would be worry? Is there an analog in another tradition where there's a worry that power has you know kind of been slipped oh, away? Oh, I think this is I think this is a, a, a common concern, right? and it, 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 it's a question of who's authorized to teach. Um, it's a question of um, what kind of claims a practitioner can make. Right. It's a question of uh, potentially danger for practitioners. Yeah. Yeah, it's a number of issues involved. And, and, and these issues can come up when you have someone who's a popularizer, right? Right, right. Like Lady was. Right. right. Mm. 
Well, it's true that by empowering a lay, that, the layperson in that particular lineage, he did, he did do something highly unusual. Yet it doesn't seem um, to have engendered any, any really overt pushback and sustained pushback. Perhaps for the reasons I said, it, it's, it, nonetheless, it, didn't, it hasn't become like a, a dominant movement that seems to compete with monastic authority. I suppose that would be the reason why. So by the mid 20th century, there were um, people from all over the world coming to Burma to practice meditation, or at least they had the opportunity to practice meditation right. when they came to Burma if they didn't come there for that explicitly. Right. Right? So when, when someone came to Burma from Europe or the United States in the 1950s, right, where did they go and what kinds of meditation did they practice? Well, most would go to um, uh, the, the Mahasi Yeta, the Mahasi Meditation Center. Um, Mahasi, who, as we discussed, was the student of Bingon Seada, had been established at this meditation center in Yangon in 1949 and became the de facto, essentially the de facto um, uh, official meditation center of the Burmese government. He was greatly patronized, Mahasi Seada was, by um, Unu, the prime minister, uh, and um, was a tremendously influential force uh, in, in mass meditation, certainly from that time onwards. Uh, and so there was just a natural gravitational pull towards him. At the same time, as we can read in, um, in memoirs of meditation uh, uh, aficionados, what have you, um, uh, people would also go to the Insight Meditation Center of Uba Kim. That was another place that really drew a significant number of people in. Uh, and Winston King has, for instance, the, the scholar of Buddhism um, who, who you know, was mostly working in the 1960s and 70s, who wrote uh, A Thousand Lives Away and a, and a number of other books about Burmese Buddhism. Um, he went there, and he has actually even a, a, a little... Um, uh, a brief description and an appendix of his experience of an Uba Kin meditation retreat uh, at the end of his book. Um, uh, I believe, it, well, one of his books, either In the Hope of Nibbana or A Thousand Lives Away, I'm not sure which. Um, so it's quite clear that it was these two, essentially these two centers mm -hmm. that drew people in. So what were people learning? They were essentially learning uh, Mingon or Lady techniques as they had become standardized and formulated through their successors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really why they've become such influential phenomenons because very early on in in a very clear and accessible way they had established meditation as a as a, a plausible technique in a simple and standardized way maybe not simple to do but simple to understand what you needed to do uh, and so it became the big draws these two centers but so many people who are have become successful meditation teachers in the late 20th century uh, actually learned meditation initially from Goenka mm -hmm. in India and not in Burma. That's right. It doesn't seem that that um, availability of meditation instruction in Burma in the 50s and 60s really gave rise to the international movement. Um, it, it seems at one remove. Is that fair or, or are there strands that come straight out of Burma from 49 up through the 60s out into the global stage? I think that um, Mahasi most definitely uh, is, is a direct connection out into the global stage. Um, although after the, the coup in 62, it became very difficult um, for folks to come in and learn meditation or really just to come into Burma at all. Uh, and because of that, most definitely there was a limit. I mean, there's famous stories of, of the Western students of Uba Kin for instance, I, I know particularly from that tradition that uh, when there were only um, when you could only come in for uh, seven days uh, for a week, they would fly in and fly out, fly in and fly out, and they would do this in order to have a full retreat. They'd fly back and forth from, say, Bangkok or wherever. Um, but that that certainly undercut the possibilities for practice. For Mahasi, I think um, it he had made enough of an influence, and certainly into Thailand as well. And there was the possibility to come and practice that made it possible for him to directly influence people um, and, and some of his students who moved out too, because of course one of his influential students, Munindra, who I think I mentioned a while ago in our conversation, um, he was an, an Indian national who went back to India and was able to train a number of people there too. So although Burma was difficult to go to, 
um, some of the teachings were already available outside, um, but in direct connection to the, to the people inside Burma. Uh, and Jack Cornfield was able to actually go to Burma and study directly there, for instance. So there's a direct connection to Mahasi there. Uh, at the same time, you're quite right that Goenka becomes particularly influential because he leaves Burma and he also happens to go to the country where a great deal of 1960s baby boomer seekers are arriving on sort of spiritual quests or maybe they're vaguely interested in that along with what other reasons they might be on the overland trail or whatever uh, to India. And so he's able to capture a large audience and of many of the most influential meditation teachers today you know, that's where they had their, many of their experience, like Salzburg and Sharon Salzburg and a number of other people. Um, so it's true that um, Goenka becomes a particularly important link to the global phenomenon of mass meditation because of his immigration to India and his establishment of his organization there. So I think it's a mix. You have the direct influence of Burma, but then also particular key disciples, particularly Goenka, who leave and go to other places and are more accessible. If, if Lady Sayada could read the recent Time magazine with the Mindful Revolution on the cover, okay. what would he say? You know, I've thought about this in the context um, of some of the innovators who follow from him, like Goenka, who makes the argument rather in line, at least to this degree, with that article that this, these practices aren't even Buddhist. That they are from the Buddha, but they're kind of a common heritage of um, just understanding the nature of the world, for instance, and the way our minds work. And in, based upon that, the thinking, I, I've often been, it struck me that in many ways he'd actually be quite sympathetic because my impression of him from reading all of his works, or, or many of them, um, uh, and many of meditation is that he was a very practical man and not somebody who was particularly interested in um, promoting Buddhism as such for the practitioner simply because um, he had a belief that Buddhism was the best. He certainly did think Buddhism was the best system, but he seems to have been very practically oriented in the sense he wanted to benefit people. And I can't imagine that he wouldn't be happy if people were engaged in these practices. Um, but he absolutely had no doubt that Buddhism as a tradition was the the final word on the nature of reality and as a system in and of itself was um, the quintessence of wisdom. And so I cannot imagine that he would be, um, that he would, that he would be pleased by the notion that practice might never go any further than techniques for self-flourishing in this life that never made the move to the ultimate concerns he had from a Buddhist perspective. I think that's probably the way to put it because um, I don't think he would begrudge people the ability to improve their lives through through practices that are even are understood to have a benefit in this life. And I suppose he would readily admit that there might be certain benefits in this life, even though they weren't a particular concern of his in his writings. But to stop there, I think, would be, um, for him, I suspect would be a real disappointment. And the idea that these weren't Buddhist, too, would, I think, strike him as... Um, at best semantics, but at worst a distortion of uh, the real contribution a figure he saw as a perfectly awakened one made to the world. Uh, and to that degree would probably give him pause to say it's not Buddhist or, you know, um, um, need not be called um, Buddhist. Eric, it's been a pleasure having you here at the University of Virginia. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. I enjoyed it.